Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, welcome to episode number 195 of the Healing Pain Podcast. Today we're discussing how does ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy differ from traditional cognitive behavioral therapy or pain education interventions, which are commonly used for the treatment of chronic pain. Many of you send me emails or instant message me on Facebook and you ask me questions, of course, about pain and other aspects of biopsychosocial care with regard to chronic pain. And this is one of the most common questions. How does ACT differ from pain education or pain neuroscience? How does ACT differ from traditional cognitive behavioral therapy? So I figured I would do an episode specifically dedicated to this topic, discuss the differences, and of course, share a little bit about the evidence-based research. Today, I'm also doing something really brand new and exciting that I'm thrilled to share with you. Today, this episode is going to be available for continuing education units. So you can, of course, listen to this for free. So let's say if you're driving in your car or you're on the treadmill, or maybe you're listening to this at home as you're cooking, or maybe you're in the clinic listening to this as you're treating patients, you're more than welcome to access this for free. But you can also access this episode now and earn continuing education units. So with that, I want to be able to share some objectives with you because we'll discuss what we're going to be learning about today. So on today's episode, you'll be able to identify three cognitive processes of change related to pain explain three ways that ACT differs from cognitive behavioral therapy or pain education. And by the end, you'll learn how to use three simple cognitive diffusion techniques for the treatment of chronic pain. Cognitive diffusion is a technique that we use in acceptance and commitment therapy. So I just want you all to know, of course, if, this is, if you're going to apply for this for uh, CEUs or CEs, that the Integrated Pain Science Institute is recognized by the New York State Education Department, State Board of Physical Therapy, as an approved provider of physical therapists and physical therapist assistant continuing education. Of course, many other states recognize New York's upwards of 30 states in the United States of America recognize New York State as an approved provider. And many states don't check CEUs, so make sure you check with your um, state board and save the core certificate so you can send that in for CEUs. If you're an occupational therapist, all courses meet the suggested requirements for continuing education for occupational therapy, as outlined by the National Board for Certification in Occupational Occupational Therapy, that's the NBCOT. If you're a psychologist or another mental health provider, the Integrated Pain Science Institute is approved by the American Psychological Association to sponsor continuing education for psychologists. And finally, if you are a certified health coach, The Integrated Pain Science Institute is recognized by the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching as an approved continuing education provider. So lots of different ways to register and have this course approved for CEs or CEUs, depending on the profession that you're in. So after listening to today's episode, here's what you do. You go to the IntegratedPainScienceInstitute.com. So go to the website. On the top, scroll over to where it says Courses. And then you can scroll down to listen and learn. So you're going to click on the button that says listen and learn. Once there, you're going to purchase episode number 195. Once you purchase episode number 195, there'll be a link to the episode again if you want to listen to it again or if you want to read it. Of course, the entire episode as well as the slides will be available there for you to reference. And then there's a very short, easy and negotiable quiz at the end that you have to take for fulfillment of CEU. So this is a really easy, fast low cost and affordable way to earn some CEs or some CEUs. Of course, if you have any questions, you can simply send us an email at support at integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's support at integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. Okay, let's begin with how ACT differs from traditional cognitive behavior therapy or pain education interventions. I think a pretty good place to start is just go over a little definition of what pain education is. So we have a little bit of a context as far as where we're going with this episode and this week's learning. So pain education is basically a method of educating patients about the neurophysiology of pain that aims to reconceptualize pain from an indicator of damage 
to an interpretation of signals by the brain and nervous system. So basically, we're helping someone reconceptualize pain from one of bodily damage from that biomedical or biomechanical approach of bodily damage to one of a biopsychosocial cause or biopsychosocial approach toward healing pain. Kind of the 10,000 foot view pain education me methods help patients understand the biology and physiology of chronic pain, as well as the psychosocial factors that influence pain. And with that, there's a changing or a reconciling of faulty cognitions or maladaptive cognitions, whatever word you want to use with regard to thoughts and beliefs associated with pain and their impact on disability. Now, earlier, what's called psychoeducation, or what we now all know as pain education, really started in the early 1980s. So one of the first studies around 1986 by Klaber was conducted, and that was really not what we would identify as pain education today. It was really more of a back school, in essence, where we provide some information with regard to how to maintain a healthy back. Now, some of that really was primarily from a biomedical model. So over the course of many decades with the work of Laura Mosley and David Butler, Adrian Lowe, many other people have contributed to pain education. We now have that more biopsychosocial approach to pain education. But ultimately, pain education or psychoeducation, very similar. Um, psychoeducation is a component of traditional cognitive behavioral therapy. And from that, we've taken that component of psychoeducation, we built it out kind of to that larger pain education approach. But ultimately, they're all similar where we help people with that biopsychosocial recognition of what's happening. And we help them change distorted beliefs or distorted, distorted thoughts with regard to uh, their pain and their injury. So let's just briefly touch on mechanisms of change or processes of change with regard to, let's talk about cognitive behavioral therapy first. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a, a large intervention. It can be anywhere between one session to upwards of, let's say, 21 sessions that cover many, many different types of topics. But in general, when we look at cognitive behavioral therapy for the treatment of chronic pain, the processes, the psychological processes associated with that change are one, psychoeducation, which we've already mentioned, cognitive reappraisal, so helping people reappraise their thoughts, modifying core beliefs, behavioral activation, so helping people with uh, pleasant activities and um, exposure or graded exposure, arousal reduction, so that's things like stress modification or relaxation therapy, and then finally, motivational enhancement. There are lots of different types of processes of changes. I kind of gave you the top seven right here, so psychoeducation, cognitive reappraisal, modifying core beliefs, behavioral activation, arousal reduction, exposure strategies, and then finally, motivational enhancement. So those are seven to be most aware of when you're working with, let's say, cognitive behavioral techniques or cognitive behavioral intervention. The proposed mechanisms of change for pain education really basically is that reconceptualization or that conceptualization specifically around concepts associated with fear, fear avoidance, knowledge and beliefs about pain, and in essence, pain itself. So with pain education techniques or interventions, we hope that we are imparting new learning on someone who has pain. And with that, it changes their self-efficacy. There's an improved therapeutic relationships that happens with patients once they realize that we're giving them new information that helps them cope with or help them, helps them overcome their pain. Um, there's an enhancement of motivation. And then finally, probably the most important part is the prom promotion of behavior change. It's all about behavior change. That's what we're all aiming for which leads to improved functional outcomes. So on some level, both traditional cognitive behavioral therapy and pain education, pain neuroscience education, all have to do with changing or modifying thoughts and beliefs. So I just want you to reflect for a moment there, and I want you to think about the average patient who you've seen in your clinic that let's say has had chronic lower back pain that's been to anywhere between two to 10 different practitioners. We know that patients see many different types of practitioners before they come to a viable solution for their pain. Just think about all the various types of thoughts and beliefs that exist in their mind that some they have developed on their own and some have been, let's say, placed there by practitioners that are not up to date on the latest modern pain science or pain education. So things like, a weak core or herniated disc in your back or your pelvis is out of alignment or your spine is unstable or there's a pinched nerve um, or your spine is narrowing and it's press, pressing on nerves or potentially that you're getting old and your body doesn't function well when you get older anymore. And then as you get degeneration, it means you'll 
move less or you'll move in a less healthy way. All these are thoughts and beliefs that patients adopt sometimes through their own um, process and sometimes through interaction with other practitioners. So there's a lot that we're, you know, we're trying to help people cope with here as they're overcoming pain. And the question I want to pose to you today as we kind of shift from the more traditional uh, CBT approaches toward um, more third wave approaches is, can we really change thoughts? Can, and if we can change thoughts, in essence, we're really saying we, on some level we can control thoughts. Can we really change pain-related beliefs? Can we really reframe pain? Can we really reconceptualize pain? So just think about that for a couple moments. Can we really change thoughts? Can we really change beliefs? Can we really reframe and reconceptualize pain? So let's look at some of the research on that. So this is a systematic review and meta-analysis on pain neuroscience education for chronic low back pain. This is pretty recent, 2018, um, in the European Journal of Pain. And there's three important outcomes that they found with regard to uh, pain and disability after pain neuroscience education for the treatment of chronic pain. So the first point is that pain neuroscience education probably improves disability in the short term, irrespective of whether it's delivered in conjunction with physical, th physical therapy or not. Some good information there. You may decide just to deliver PNE or other types of pain education by itself. If you decide to deliver it with physical therapy, you're more likely to have a more clinically significant improvement in disability. So you can deliver it just on its own. But if you deliver it with another intervention, specifically physical therapy, more likely to have significant improvement in disability. So good news there. PNE as a standalone intervention or in combination with physical therapy, in general, according to this systematic review, has little effect on pain scores in both the short term and the long term. So the idea that this is going to um, alleviate someone's pain significantly, we probably don't have a lot of good research on that. Another mixed method systematic review and meta-analysis, this is from the American Pain Society in the Journal of Pain. This is 2019, so more recent. A little bit more, a little more information here that they gave us. So I'll give you kind of the, the do's and the does and does not, so to speak. So pain neuroscience education does not produce clinically significant decreases in pain. It does not produce clinically significant decreases in disability, so not, not good news there. But it does produce significant decreases in kinesiophobia, and it does produce significant decreases in pain catastrophizing. So those bottom two, kinesiophobia and pain catastrophizing, are really important because when you look back toward those processes of change, when you look at negative thinking or you look at the reappraisal of thoughts, those two are really important. So that fear of movement, that kinesiophobia, and that pain catastrophizing, very important moderators with regard to the persistence of pain. So you can safely say that pain neuroscience education or other pain education interventions explain pain are good for kinesiophobia and pain catastrophizing. But the one article that I want to share with you, which is this one here, which is in Pain Research and Management 2018, this was a qualitative study that looked at the reconceptualization of pain after pain neurophysiology education in adults with chronic low back pain. So the researchers of this article basically tried to decipher, did people reconceptualize pain after an intervention of pain neuroscience education? There are only about 12 subjects in this study, but when they look at those 12, three fully reconceptualized pain, three subjects showed no evidence of the reconceptualization of pain. And what I think is most important is that six, six subjects had partial or patchy reconceptualization. So that partial or patchy means that they had language that was consistent or they used language that was consistent with the reconceptualization of pain, but also language that was consistent with, their, with a biomedical understanding of pain. So there was that partial or patchy reconceptualization. So it kind of starts to point to the fact that there may be a small group that we can completely change thoughts and change beliefs, meaning they fully reconceptualize. But so far, the vast majority of clients or patients that we see probably have partial or patchy reconceptualization. Now, there's a number of different reasons why that may happen. Some of that is clinician expertise. So how good, it, how good a clinician is at delivering pain education. Some of it is the um, education of the patient themselves with regard to um, learning and adopting this new information. Some of it is the amount of time that was spent, whether that was um, the total amount of time 
or whether it was, uh, you know, spread out over uh, multiple sessions. A lot goes into delivering a cognitive intervention like this. So if we can't change pain-related thoughts and beliefs, then we have to turn to other types of approaches or methods with regard to people's thoughts and beliefs around pain. So there are more advanced cognitive behavioral approaches that are newer. Of course, acceptance and commitment therapy is one of them, where there's less of an emphasis on changing thoughts, on changing beliefs, and in essence, on changing pain itself. There's not a really good, a big emphasis on changing pain itself. Basically, ACT is a cognitive behavioral intervention that uses mindfulness and acceptance processes, along with commitment and behavior change processes to increase a core psychological process known as psychological flexibility. So psychological flexibility is a big topic. We don't have time to go into all of it today, but a definition of psychological flexibility is the ability to maintain open contact with either unpleasant or unwanted thoughts, feelings, memories, and physical sensations while you choose behaviors that are in line with your personal values or goals. So big mouthful, what does that mean? Can you give me an example? Okay, let's take an example. So for example, um, I don't particularly enjoy public speaking. I, I do it because I have to, it's what I do for a living. But when I public speak, oftentimes I have unpleasant or unwanted thoughts like, well, maybe people think that I'm stupid or they don't understand what I'm, I'm thinking or they think I look funny or they think, I don't know, I'm a short guy and I appear taller on video. So many different thoughts kind of go through my head about different things. In essence, there are unpleasant experiences that come up. So for me to engage in the process of psychological flexibility, I can have contact, I can main, maintain contact or observe those thoughts, as well as the feelings in my body. So for example, when I have anxiety about people thinking those thoughts about me as I'm lecturing at a conference, I get a little bit nervous. I get a little bit of a stomach uh, pain. My palms get sweaty. Um, I get memories back when I was in college and I had to give like my first presentation. All sorts of different experiences tend to come up. However, I choose to do this type of work because it's in line with my personally chosen values and goals. So my personal value is I like helping people overcome their pain. So I have to teach in, on some ex to some extent. And I like helping practitioners learn new ways that they can implement different types of strategies into their clinical practice. So public speaking fits with my values and my goals. So of course, with regard to pain, it would be helping someone maintain contact with both physical pain in their body, as well as thoughts about pain or feelings of being inadequate or feelings of pain related anxiety or memories of maybe um, injuring themselves being able to contact all of that psychological content, but still choose behaviors that are in line with their personal values and goals. So that's an example of psychological flexibility. So what's the mechanism behind acceptance and commitment therapy? Well, there are six different core processes. their present moment awareness, values, committed action, selfish context, cognitive diffusion, which we're going to go into on today's episode and acceptance. So those six processes in essence fold into one larger process called psychological flexibility, which is what we just spoke about in the previous slide. Okay, let's zoom in on just one of those processes today so you can have some good take-homes with you, and that's cognitive diffusion. So in traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, there's cognitive reappraisal, where we help people change their thoughts and beliefs. In ACT, there's something called cognitive diffusion, which is basically helping someone watch or observe their, their thoughts or watch and observe their thinking. So a couple of examples of this is allowing thoughts to come and go. So you can think of thoughts kind of like the weather. So at times the weather rolls in and it's nice and calm and sunny. And at times the weather rolls in and it's dark and stormy. And our thoughts can be that way as well. So just allowing thoughts to come and go as they wish. Um, a second one would be noticing thoughts or not getting caught up in thoughts. And then a third would be noticing thoughts and not having them influence behavior. So in essence, we can have negative thoughts or we can have negative beliefs, but they don't necessarily have to influence our behavior. Super important with regard to chronic pain. So for example, you may have a thought that this exercise is not good for my back, but it doesn't necessarily have to influence your behavior of you engaging with that exercise or engaging with other activities that are similar to that exercise, thinking that they're going to be damaging for your spine. So it's kind of an example of cognitive diffusion. So allowing thoughts to come and go, noticing thoughts and not getting caught up in them, 
and noticing that thoughts do not have to influence behavior. And comparing cognitive restructuring or cognitive reappraisal with cognitive diffusion te techniques has, has been studied. So this is a 2016 article from Behavior Modification, the Journal of Behavior Modification, where they looked at cognitive restructuring versus cognitive diffusion to cope with negative thoughts. And three really important things came out of this that I kind of put up here on the screen for you. So the first is that negative thoughts are experienced by 80 to 99% of the population. That right there, just sharing that with people who have pain is super important because what it does is it normalizes our normal patterns of human thinking. So if you can just normalize that all of us have negative thoughts, those of us who don't have pain and those of us that have pain, it's a really good way to help decrease someone's anxiety about their entire pain experience. Um, the second bullet here that we have on the screen is that cognitive diffusion lowered the believability of thoughts, which I think is really interesting. So even though we're not um, trying to target beliefs with ACT, that in some way cognitive, cognitive diffusion did lower believability, it increased someone's comfort and willingness to have negative thoughts, and it increased positive affect significantly more than cognitive restructuring. And then finally, the most important data that came out of this study was that the negative thought frequency was reduced in the diffusion group, it was maintained in the restructuring group, and that it increased in the control group or the group that had no instruction. Cognitive diffusion actually, with this particular group, with regards to negative thoughts, helped decrease the frequency of thoughts. Cognitive restructuring maintained, so there really was no change with regard to cognitive restructuring. So some really good information that shows that there may be a strong place to use cognitive diffusion to allow thoughts or to simply notice thoughts versus changing thoughts and beliefs. Okay, earlier I promised you three simple cognitive diffusion techniques that you can take to your clinic right now. So basically we help people with their awareness of thoughts or help them observe thoughts, thoughts or to notice thoughts. So here's what you can do with your patient to ask them to notice thoughts. So the first is, what is your mind telling you right now? So simple, really simple question. So maybe as you're starting them on a new exercise, or maybe you're doing a manual therapy technique that maybe is a little bit painful, or they're talking about an experience they have with their pain, just stop them just nice and gently and say, hey, what is your mind telling you right now about pain? And see what they say. So just stopping the flow of their thoughts and having them recognize or observe what their mind is telling them right now. Second phrase, what is your mind broadcasting right now? So in essence, looking at the mind as almost like um, the news, what is your mind broadcasting right now? So what story is your mind telling you right now? So they're not saying the story is true or false, just what is your mind broadcasting right now? If you were to stop right now for one minute and just notice your thoughts, you would notice the mind broadcasts all different types of thoughts just within 60 seconds. It's so interesting. And then finally, what type of thoughts is your mind generating? So is your mind generating, let's say, negative thoughts right now? Or is your mind generating positive thoughts? And just helping people notice that the mind generates both positive, negative, as well as neutral thoughts, whether or not we do anything to um, facilitate that. That on its own, the mind broadcasts different thoughts. The mind broadcasts thoughts that are positive, thoughts that are negative, and some that are neutral. And just recognizing or noticing or observing what your mind is telling you right now is a way to work on that process of cognitive diffusion. Okay, in addition to noticing thoughts, we help people identify what's called workability in acceptance and commitment therapy. So workability is the concept of, is the behavior you're engaging workable for your personally held values and goals? What's interesting about behavioral therapies in, in general is that thoughts are looked upon as a behavior. So I'll say that one more time, thoughts, are looked upon as a behavior, or we help people become more aware of the workability of their thoughts. So a couple, three um, questions you can ask your patient is if you hold on to this thought tightly, does it help you return to the activity and the life you want? Second, if you let this thought tell you what to do, will it take you toward the life you want or keep you stuck suffering? So in essence, like the mind can almost be a bully and bully you into doing things. And then third, if you stop just because your mind says this will hurt, or because your mind broadcasts the thought that don't do this, will that move you toward or away who and what's important in your life? So the concept of workability and working that into your session with regard to cognitive diffusion is very important. And then finally, we ask patients to notice when they're fused with their own thoughts. 
So being fused with your own thought is like, just imagine like a swirl of thoughts circling all around your head and you really can't see the road in front of you. So we help people gain some space or um, create some distance between them and their thoughts. So for example, here and now, how caught up are you in that thought? So you might want to ask someone that if they say, no, I, I can't do this exercise or this exercise is not good for my back. Here and now, how caught up, how caught up are you in the thought that if you bend forward, it's going to cause you to have more uh, pain in your back. Second, you might ask, did you notice how your mind hooked you or tried to take control or protect you or bully you as you're doing this exercise or as we're engaged in our therapy session together? So again, simple ways to help patients notice when they're fused with their own thinking. So the question is, if, if traditional cognitive behavioral therapy and pain education focuses on uh, symptom reduction, specifically the symptoms, of course, are pain, but also the symptoms of fear and anxiety are, are big with those approaches. And of course, changing thoughts. Is pain reduction and changing thoughts necessary for a return to function? And this is from the Journal of Consulting Clinical Psychologists 2017, which basically asked the question, are reductions in pain intensity and pain-related distress necessary? And what they did was they took patients who went through a multidisciplinary acceptance and commitment therapy uh, program for the treatment of pain. They did some follow-up studies at three months with about 174 patients. And what they found was that decreases in pain and pain-related distress, so things like anxiety and depression and uh, pain catastrophizing, were not necessarily, did not necessarily have to decrease in order for functioning to increase. So reductions in pain intensity and thoughts and beliefs related to pain do not necessarily have to change to see our patients return to that rich, full, and active life that they desire. And in addition to the, the, those multidisciplinary type interventions it, that are typically in hospitals, um, we have a definite lack of those in the United States of America. But if you're a physical therapist, let's say, or another practitioner who is weaving principles of ACT um, into your care or into your, your um, treatment sessions, this is from 2019, the Journal of Pain, that basically showed that ACT combined with physical therapy was successful for reducing disability. It was acceptable to both patients and clinicians to deliver this type of care in the clinic, and that physical therapists could incorporate principles of ACT with um, high fidelity, meaning they can stay true to the ACT model of pain. And I want to make sure I share this slide with you. So if someone asks you, okay, what's the difference between ACT and pain education? Probably the most common question I get from a physical therapist, hey, Joe, what's the difference between ACT and pain education? Well, there, essentially there are seven uh, differences or seven distinctions between ACT and pain education. So pain education changes thoughts or beliefs. ACT is about allowing thoughts and beliefs. Pain education focuses on alleviating pain or symptoms. ACT helps people respond differently to pain or other types of symptoms. Um, there's no values work in pain education. There is definitely a values clarification process, which is a key process of cognitive change, which is part of acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, typically in pain education, there is what's called graded exposure. So that's either time contingent uh, that happens over time. With ACT, there's more behavioral exposure. So in essence, if someone wants to engage in, into an, act, to an activity um, or an exercise even that is in line with their values, then we encourage them to do that, even if there may be some um, discomfort or even some pain. Pain education has one process of change, which in essence is new knowledge or new, edu uh, new education. ACT has those six core processes that fold in, into essentially that seven process of psychological flexibility. Um, with regard to ACT, there's been over 300 randomized controlled trials and about six or seven meta-analyses for the treatment of uh, chronic pain and associated conditions, um, less with regard to pain education. Of course, that's a much newer technique. We're still learning more about uh, pain education. And of course, it's important work that we should continue to learn about. And then finally, eventually I'll do a podcast episode on this topic with regard to the therapeutic relationship. So in general, the therapeutic relationship with pain education runs the risk of one where it's a relationship of inequality because in essence, the provider or the practitioner has more knowledge than the patient has. With regard to ACT, because we're working on being open, aware, and engaged or open, aware, and active it, with the patient, not only with the patient, but with us as well, with, with clinicians as well, 
we want to cultivate the same psychological processes. And with that, we aim for a relationship or a therapeutic relationship of equality. Meaning as a practitioner, I don't necessarily have any um, great or important information. In essence, I believe that the information to help someone um, heal and move on or move forward from their pain actually resides in them. And what I'm doing as a practitioner is just facilitating their values and their goals to help them move beyond pain. So the therapeutic relationship is, is very different between um, pain education and acceptance and commitment therapy. So at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, well, there's traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, there's acceptance and commitment therapy, there's pain education, pain neuroscience education. Which method should I choose? Well, there was a study recently that actually explored this in the European Journal of Pain, and they asked the question, what are the necessary components of psychological treatment in chronic pain management programs? And the outcome basically was that there are three aspects or three components that are, in essence, the gold standard for the psychological treatment of pain, and that's pain education or psychoeducation. Again, you can use those interchangeably. Any type of cognitive behavioral approach and strategies to increase physical activity. So I'll say that one more time. Pain education or psychoeducation, any cognitive behavioral approach, and strategies to increase physical activity. So if you can combine those three, those three are the necessary components for the psychological treatment of pain. Now, in this particular study, they said any cognitive behavioral therapy. I'd like to kind of share with you why I tend to lean a little bit more toward ACT with regard to the, the treatment of chronic pain. So the first from this systematic review and meta-analysis from 2011 is that we know that ACT has comparable effect sizes with regard to both physical and mental health when compared to other types of traditional cognitive behavioral therapy. So we know it's probably just as good as traditional cognitive behavioral therapies. Then later on, 2016, the Journal of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, ACT showed significantly higher effects on depression and anxiety than mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Mindfulness-based stress reduction is not technically um, a cognitive behavioral therapy, but it has lots of principles of cognitive and behavioral uh, components wrapped into it. Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is essentially a traditional cognitive behavioral model where they weave in a little bit of mindfulness. So ACT showed higher effects on depression and anxiety than those, type, those two different interventions. So I think that's really important. So I know that Many of our clients struggle with depression and anxiety, so ACT may be better for certain people, shall we say. And then finally, 2017, new systematic review and meta-analysis was that there were significant medium large effect sizes with regard to pain acceptance and psychological flexibility. And I think that's really important, especially as a physical therapist. Pain acceptance, if I can help move the needle just a little bit on pain acceptance and psychological flexibility, people are more likely to engage with exercise and physical activity. So I want to thank you for downloading this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast and attending this listen and learn session. Again, this is available for two hours of CE slash CEUs. You can access that on the website at the Integrated Pain Science Institute.com. Just go over to the courses tab and then down to listen and learn and then click on episode number 195. Once you get inside the course, you'll be able to access the podcast again if you want to listen to it again. Um, the entire slide presentation will be there, and there'll be a short, brief, easily negotiable quiz for you to take so you can get your CEUs. And just to summarize today's episode, there are many methods, many cognitive behavioral methods to choose from with regard to the treatment of chronic pain. Some focus on changing thoughts and beliefs. Others like ACT focus on observing and relating differently to thoughts and beliefs. These methods can coexist together. So for example, you can spend, let's say, the first session and work on a little bit of pain education. And then from there, if you notice that thoughts and beliefs are not changing, then it might be wise to shift toward a more acceptance and mindfulness-based approach um, to pain. But these methods can definitely coexist together. And I really recommend that you try to integra integrate them together because the truth is there's not one method that works for, for every patient. There's not one method that works for every type of diagnosis that's out there. So I recommend that you mix and match this to patient needs and of course, to the patient, patient's clinical presentation. Okay, it's been great spending this time with you today to discuss how ACT differs from traditional cognitive behavioral therapy or pain education interventions. Again, this is a listen, learn, and earn CEU episode, so make sure you go over 
to the website at the Integrated Pain Science Institute and sign up for that low cost, easily and affordable CEU. I'm Dr. Joe Tad. I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.